And then the people around asked him, what is wrong? Why do you say that? He said, you know, I was just walking around, looking at the creation, the plantation, and I don't think whether God did a very good balance. He said, what do you mean? Look at a very big tree. You know, a very big tree producing very small nuts. And a very small plant producing a very big watermelon. You know, God did not balance things very well. And as he was arguing, a small nut fell from the tree and hit him on the head. And then he looked around and said, Thank God it was not a watermelon. <laughs> Friends, he is the creator of everything, even them that deny him. And secondly, he is the preeminent sustainer of all things. Verse 17 says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Christ existed in eternity past, having created all things, and he has the power to sustain all things. Friends, he is the almighty God, and he is before all things, and everything holds together by him. The Lord is the one who provides seed for the farmer, and the Lord is the one who brings rains. For he and him alone is the sustainer. Friends, I don't know that bit where you feel that God cannot sustain us. You want to do something by yourself, but it is good to know that he sustains everything. He is the Lord, the God who provides goofies. And the same God who provides goofies is the same God who provides jobs and blessings. Praise the name of the Lord. He's the one who provides jobs and he is the one who is able to sustain those jobs and he is the one who is able to elevate his people. The Lord breaks and the Lord binds us up. Though the Lord strikes, his hand also aids. You see friends, we go to bed, but it is the Lord who provides us with sleep. We drive cautiously, but it is the Lord who gives us safety. We are treated by the doctors, but then the Lord and Him alone is the one who gives us health. We take all the measures, but the Lord is the one who keeps us safe. Friends, He says that you will have many trouble in this world, but be of great joy, be of good cheer, because I have already overcome the world. And thirdly, He is the head and the first one from among the dead. He died and he rose again. Verse 18 says, and He is the head of the body that is the church, and He is the beginning and the first one from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. Ladies and gentlemen, the love that God has for the church nourishes us as partakers of this redemption. And again, you know, we are first to rise with him, with the resurrection body, because he did that. And he who believes in Christ, even though they die, they will rise again. We have examples in the Bible of people who died, and they came back to life. You remember the story of Jairus' daughter? He was called back to life by Jesus in Luke chapter 8, but then shortly after that, she died again. You remember the son of the widow in name in Luke chapter 7. She brought back to life, but then seven years down the line, she died again. You remember Paul rises Eutychus from the dead. You know, Paul is preaching, Eutychus comes to church, and then right at the middle of the sermon, Eutychus sleeps, and then he falls from the building, falls down, and he dies. And then Paul goes back, prays for Eutychus, Eutychus comes back to life, and Paul did not finish the sermon at that point. He goes back to continue preaching, you know? But then shortly after that, Eutychus died. Do you remember Peter raises Tabitha from the dead in Acts chapter 9? But then four years down the line, Tabitha died again. All these people are raised from the dead, but they rose to die again. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rose 
never to die again, and he is alive today. Lazarus also is our example today. He died, and he rose again. But then, he died again. And then the fourth thing that we learn is that the fullness of God in bodily form, verse 19. That the totality of God with all his power and attributes, the very essence of deity, was present in totality in Christ. He was 100% man and 100% God. And that means that he understands us well. We are encouraged in verse 10, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head of every power and authority. Friends, that is very, very important, that we have been given all the power and all the authority. And you know what that means? That means that we have the ability to command the evil spirits in the name of Jesus and they obey. James Stewart says that Jesus Christ was the meekest and the lowliest of all the sons of men. Yet he spoke of coming of the, in the clouds of, of heaven with the glory of God. He was so serious that evil spirits and demons cried out in fear of his coming. Yet he was so friendly and lovely and approachable that the little children loved to play with him. His presence at the village wedding was like the presence of sunshine. No one was half so compassionate to sinners, yet no one ever spoke such red hot scotch words about sin. He was, uh, his whole life was love. He was a dreamer of dreams and a sea of visions. He was a servant of all, washing the disciples' feet. Friends, the one that we're talking about today is a project. He's very simple to us. He comes down to where we are. And then Paul tells us that we are complete in Him. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them that you are complete in Him. You are complete in Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. So Paul tells us that Christ is a creator. He created everything for nothing. He is a preeminent sustainer of all things. He is the head of the church and the firstborn from among the dead. And through him, we see the fullness of God in God before. So what does it mean now for us to set Christ you know, apart as the Lord? That means that we regard him as the holiest being in the universe. Regard him as unique one of a kind, without peer, you know, or rival in purity. To put him in a category by himself, the highest place and the greatest value, the most supreme treasure, the greatest admiration, the most cherished prize, the one you esteem and honor, the one that you love, the one that you respect. And so why should we do that? Because, you see, as human beings, there's always a struggle. There's an inward struggle as well as an outward struggle. And the Bible mentions the human heart almost 300 times. And in essence, this is what it says, that the heart is a spiritual part of us where our emotions and desires dwell. The center of the physical, the mental and spiritual life of every human. And that human heart, in its natural condition, is evil and deceitful. And Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? In other words, the fall has affected us at the deepest level. Our mind, our emotions, and desires have been tainted by sin. And so Jesus painted out the fallen condition of our heart in Mark 7, where he says, From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, profanity, envy, slander, arrogance, and recklessness. And all this comes from inside and make us so happy. But then our biggest problem is not external, but very internal. And all this is because on the one hand, we want to honor our commitments, but on the other hand, we are tempted by lust to be dishonorable. Not wanting to be greedy, 
on the one hand, but tempted by greed on the other hand. We want to be authentic, but then the desire to conform to the standards of this world are pushing us so hard. On the one hand, we want to be truthful, but then, on the other hand, the tongue is so quick to betray us. The lust of the lie, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But then we should set aside our hearts as a place where Christ is highly honored. A place where God is highly honored. The place where His throne is existing in our hearts. Friends, Paul, writing to Timothy in the first letter, tells him to embrace the nobility of the understanding that godliness with contentment is a great gain. Because the outward struggle has to do with the outward opposition. You see, there is an ever intensified attraction for believers to conform to the standards of this world. There is a lot of pressure to conform. In fact, there is a lot of pressure for the young people to lead the kind of life that they see on TV and especially reality shows. That is the kind of life that they want to lead. But then God says, embrace the nobility of the understanding that godliness with contentment is our greater gain. In which areas should we set Christ as Lord? One, in our speech. Do not let a wholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, that you may benefit those who listen. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to, how it was to answer every person. And then Proverbs 15, 4, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness breaks the spirit. Your speech, the things that you say, the things that come out of your mouth. And then the second way is bearing with one another gently. Understanding that we are all different. We are all, all have different levels of maturity and we have to bear with one another. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keep in a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of having nothing evil to say about you. Correcting one another in love. You see, ladies and gentlemen, truth is very, very sharp. And truth without love can pierce. And that is the reason we are encouraged to do this in gentleness. One of the measures of our maturity in Christ is how we handle those of a different belief from Christ. Those who believe in Christ but have strayed away. We have to engage them. We have to correct them in gentleness. I remember two weeks ago, I had a gentleman who came to my office and he said he had come to pay me a visit and he was wearing white, pure white. And then he told me that I am Jesus and I have come for the church. You know? Say now, Jesus, you did not have trumpets before you came. You know, we, we did not hear you announce your coming. You know, the things that you talked about. I said no, that is where you get it wrong. I am He. I said, well, Jesus, then, thank you for coming for us. How do you intend us we go together with you? He said, I have just come to announce my coming. Just hold on, I'll come back with a structure. I'll proceed and come with God together. I said, thank you, Jesus. I will be waiting. And I'll prepare my church. We will be waiting for you, Lord. I'm still waiting for him. Two weeks ago, I'm still waiting for Jesus. You see, when we set apart Christ as a Lord, that will change us and it will encourage those around us. They will look at you, they will look at me, and they will say, these are people who really fear the others. That difference is all hope. Even in the midst of suffering, our hope should be apparent. That is the reason Peter instructs us in 1 Peter chapter 5 to be ready to give an answer, to give an apologia, to give an answer for the hope that we have. 
And then Titus chapter 2 verse 7 says, Show yourself in all respect to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. And one of the ways of overcoming the challenges that the conventions of the society may create is by earning people's respect. You know, people ought to be convinced that you are worth their respect. Remember that respect is not a gift of grace. Respect is a gain of godliness. You have to merit that. You see, sometimes a calm response, or even no response at all, can speak louder than yelling and shouting at the top of our voices. Allow your consistent good character to be your defense against your attackers. Leave your life in such a way that when someone tries to slander you, as the scripture says, even they will be ashamed, having nothing evil to say. And after that, after people have watched your life, they will come privately to you and ask, how do you do this? And when they do that now, you will be able to show in their heart and hearts the goodness of your heart. But then the big question remains, how can I be so hopeful in such difficult circumstances. You see friends, acknowledging the Lordship of Christ will change us and consequently it will make a difference around us. At times, things will be very tough and it will look almost unreasonable, unreasonable to hope in the Lord. When you pray, you hope that the things will get better, will get better, but you pray and hope but then things get tougher. You keep knocking and it seems not to open any door. You keep applying for those jobs without getting any opportunity. The more you pray, the more the challenges keep coming your way. See friends, my encouragement to us today, even in the midst of all that, our hope in the Lord should be applied. Our hope in the Lord should be sure. Second Peter 3 tells us that God is not slow as we understand slowness. His time is always the best. According to us, five years might be a very long time. But we are told one day is like a thousand years before the Lord. You know, His timing might be totally different from our timing. But His time will always come. You see, they tell us before it gets good, it first of all gets and looks very ugly. Even before the blind man could see, mud had to be applied on his eyes. But then the Bible profoundly affirms that weeping is for the night, but then joy comes in the morning. You see, your head may be crowned with a thorn of trouble today, but you'll wear a bright and lovely crown of victory when the morning comes. You see, friends, your garments may be soiled with that now, but in hope they will be white by and by, because his timing is always the best. Might look like he has forgotten everything about us, everything about everything that we've been praying for, but then it might take long, but be of good courage, because what he has said and what he has promised will come to us. The songwriter says, when my heart is heavy, and when my bones are weak, when I cannot stand up, his love will always guide me. When this fear I'm fighting feels like sure defeat, I will run and hide in the love that Jehovah offers. And the chorus says, the goodness of the Lord never fails me. And the goodness of the Lord overwhelms me. And the goodness of the Lord is always true. It is my prayer that the goodness of the Lord will never fail you. It is my prayer that the goodness of the Lord will continually overwhelm you with goodness. It is my prayer that the goodness of the Lord will always be true in your life. As I bring this sermon to a close, may you be an agent of change and a source of hope and inspiration wherever you go. May the word of God 
richly, you know, find a great weakness in your heart. You know, and may you always be able to give an answer for the hope that we have. You know, remember the things that Paul is talking about. Do not be deceived by these empty teachings. But that even when things take longer to be answered, the hope that we have in the Lord is sure. That the Lord is our God. And as the psalmist says, I was young and now I am an old man. And I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his children begging for bread. Because the Lord will always provide. May God bless you. And may God keep you. And may he shine his face on your lives. And whatever you trust in the Lord for, please don't lose that hope. Just hold on. Because at his own time, he will come through for you. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, hold on. Hold on. The Lord will still come through. The weeping is for the night. No, you say that as you mean it. So, weeping is for the night. But joy comes in the morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for encouraging us that you are our creator and everything holds together by you. And Lord, we pray that you will continually encourage us and that our hope in you, Christ, will always be strong. That we will never be discouraged, irrespective of the things that we go through and the things that come our life, through our lives and come our way. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will encourage us and you always strengthen us. You will forgive our sins and that Lord, you will renew our right spirit within us. Pray for these dear ones as they face the new week. I pray, Lord, that you walk before them. You walk with them. You walk before them. You walk beside them and you walk after them. That you are God, you provide light for them. You will encourage them. Even when the cost of living is becoming too tough. Lord, we pray that you will continue to provide for your people. May your grace be sufficient and may you always be our Lord. May you bless us as families. May you bless us as a community of their single mind. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. May the Lord be with you.